Chalimba has served as Chief Executive Official for Mukuba Pension Fund, Executive Director of Zambia Development Agency, Director of January for Zambia Investment Center, Head of Strategy for BP Africa, Managing Director for BP Leso and Switzerland, General Manager for Talase Zambia, Enviro Coast and Burundi, Vice President for GP Morgan. Chalimba also served as Chairman for Ecobank Zambia, Chairman for Comessas Regional Investment Agency, Chairman for Power Demolus Football Club, Chairman for Fish Time Milling, Chairman for Z Plus Capital, Vice President for the Kitwe Chamber for Commerce. Let's welcome Chalimba Piril. Thank you very much, and um, would like to thank the organizers of the event for inviting me to come and have a conversation with you, specifically around Zambia's relationship with China uh, with regard to its indebtedness. Um, Zambia has been trending recently in uh, international media and on social media because of the many stories that have been said about its indebtedness to, to China and what the consequences are. I thought of having a presentation, but after looking at the interaction from the panels and you, the audience, I thought we have a chat where I'll give you an overview of what is pertaining, uh, obtaining on the ground, and then you can fire away with your questions. It's always good to speak after lunch, you know, after adding to the <laughs> West Line. It's always a good idea to exercise as you stand here and speak. Well, Zambia got its independence in 1964 from Britain. And Zambia is a landlocked country whose land size is 752,000 square kilometers. 30% of all SADC water body is in Zambia. Zambia is the second largest copper producer on the continent after the DRC. Over the years, Zambia has slowly been growing and gaining as a new independent nation. This year we'll be celebrating our 53rd um, independence of, um, anniversary. Over the years, we've faced a lot of economic and political challenges. Some of the successes that Zambia has scored over the years are hardly ever talked about. I can talk about the political transition that has happened over the past 53 years. We have seen a peaceful and democratic transfer of power between six presidents. We had Dr. Kenneth Kaunda who ruled us from 1964 to 1991. The ruling party then, UNIP, lost the election to a newly formed party called the MMD. And President Chiluba ruled Zambia from 1991 to 2001. He handed over to Levi Mwanawasa, who ruled from 2001 to 2008 when he died in office. We had a by-election, and his then vice president won the by-election and ruled Zambia from 2008 to 2011, and that was Mr. Rupia Banda. Mr. Rupia Banda lost the election in 2011 to another opposition party called the PF, led by Mr. Michael Sata. Mr. Michael Sata ruled Zambia from 2011 to 2014. He died in office. We had another by-election. His then defense minister was the candidate for the Patriotic Front. He won the election in 2015. But because Zambia's democratic dispensation is that we have election every five years, he took over from Mr. Sata a year and a half before that five-year term came to an end. 
which meant we had an election in 2015, and then another general election in 2016, which he successfully uh, contested and defended. So you can see we've had six presidents, proper democratic trans, uh, transformation, the opposition defeating the ruling parties, but you never get to hear that being said about Zambia. So this is why I wanted to share that with you so that when we have this conversation, you can put all these things in context. So back in 1965, Rhodesia then, Southern Rhodesia, which is Zimbabwe, under Ian Smith, declared the UDI, which meant Zambia's route to port then was through Zimbabwe, then would either go to um, Durban or Cape Town uh, to export our goods. That route was cut off from us. It now meant for us to export our copper, we had to go the most difficult, expensive, and challenging route, either by air or by road. Our road infrastructure was terrible. The one going towards um, the north to the port in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania was actually called the Hell Rhine because of the number of accidents that used to happen on that uh, road, uh, stretch of road. So from 1965, the Zambian uh, government engaged the Chinese government. And the Chinese government came to Zambia's aid. We're fresh from getting independence from the British. But it was easier for Zambia to go and talk to the Chinese to give us assistance where we built a rail line linking Zambia and Tanzania, which is called Tazara. Tazara has a stretch of about 1,200 kilometers. That became our exit for exports to the East. So I'm saying this because Zambia's relationship and diplomatic connection to China is over 50 years. When you hear the narrative now, you would tend to think we just got to know China maybe in the past five or 10 years. It was in 1965 that the Chinese came to Zambia's aid, started constructing that rail line, which to this day has served us well because we now are able to export and import goods using the Tazara through Dar es Salaam. This is just an illustration of Zambia's relationship with um, um, China. Among other things that China and Zambia have been really closely linked to was Zambia's support for China's admission to the United Nations. We were one of the first countries called upon by China to support and nominate China to the United Nations. All these happened in the mid-60s. What is interesting now, looking at what is going around in the media, is why has Zambia all of a sudden been singled out as being in debt distress, being under siege, having its state assets being seized, by the Chinese. Listening to the presentation given my colleague from Kenya, I'm tempted to say, you know, this is a bit of a shade on Freud, you know. Kenya, from his presentation, is actually worse off than we are. You know, whether, I mean, I should feel good about that because I'm like, but why have they picked out Zambia? You've heard the stories of our utility company, Zesco, being um, grabbed by China. You've heard the story about our national broadcaster, ZNBC, being grabbed by China. You've heard the story about our national airport being grabbed by China. None of those are true. Okay. Zambia is being singled out, singled out for unknown reasons. And this narrative seems to be coming from the West. There is a subtle saying which says, one of the definitions of being famous is actually dominating a conversation without you being there. You can apply it personally when people gossip about you, when people talk um, negative things about you, and you're not even there. You need to ask yourself the question, what it is about me that causes people to spend all their time to talk behind my back? I have not seen anybody come to Zambia to engage us in the private sector or the government to really find out what the position is. On two occasions, the Minister of Finance has had to issue a ministerial statement in Parliament to state the exact debt position um, of the country. B, 
because of the bombardment and the constant flow of this information coming through the networks and the wires, even us Zambians are beginning to doubt ourselves and say, maybe it's true. If you are in any of the Zambian networks on social media, you will see the arguments. There are even jokes, you know, yesterday we were playing um, Guinea-Bissau in a course, in AFCON qualifier, and the joke was, how come we don't have a Chinese player in the Zambian national team? Because the perception out there is we've been overrun and we've been overtaken by the Chinese. So, yeah, you'd expect to see uh, a Chinese wearing a Chipolo Polo jersey and playing for our national team. And by the way, that game was played in a brand new 60,000 seater stadium which was built and financed, guess what, by the Chinese. A year ago, we were able to host the under 20 Africa Cup championship because we have two stadiums, one in Indola called the Levin Wanawasa and the one in Lusaka called the Heroes National Stadium, all infrastructure built and financed by the Chinese. In the past, we had attempted to host these premier sporting events. We couldn't because we did not have the infrastructure. Dr. David was talking about some of the prerequisites to development. The IMF and the World Bank would tell you, you need infrastructure to develop. You need infrastructure to industrialize. And that is exactly what Zambia's route has taken. I've just, I was just telling you about the six presidents that we've been through and the three political parties that have ruled Zambia. The policy and the engagement towards China has not changed. One would have expected maybe from UNIP to MMD, slight shift, MMD to PF, big change, nothing. All the six presidents seem to be towing the same line. And the question is why? There's probably something they have seen because we talk of Vision 2030 and this Vision 2030 is underpinned by our aspiration of, you know, which is contained in the seventh national development plan, which talks about infrastructure development, which talks about industrialization, which talks about uh, empowerment, which talks about um, rural development. All those things seem realistically achievable if maybe we caused up and had a relationship with China. So that is the route that Zambia has taken, and that is the consistency I see from the six presidents and the three different um, governments that we've had to have been taken a path on, though as being a former British colony. And if you see what is happening in Zambia now, most of the Western embassies that we had, their presence is being reduced. Most of the multinationals that we had, their presence is again being reduced. We used to have predominantly British companies in the country. Um, the BPs, the Barclays banks, they've all closed shop and they've left. And the void they are leaving, it seems countries from the south, um, from, uh, the east are taking up that place. So in other words, you know, more and more people are now tending to think, yeah, well, if they leave and there's an opportunity and the Chinese come in or the Indian come in, why not? Now, having said that, this does not come without its problems. I'll talk about that um, 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 a little later. Currently, there's a question and a debate to, to what extent is Zambia indebted to the Chinese? And I'm going to give you a figure as given to us by the finance minister in parliament. She says our official debt position with China is 2.9 billion. Of the 2.9 of the 2.9 billion, 53% of it is commercial debt. That's the official position. There are the the three state national assets that are being talked about to having been seized by China because Zambia has defaulted. I'll give you a bit of background and the reality with what is the truth around this. Starting with the airport. For those of you that have recently been to Lusaka, you will note and agree with me that the airport is under construction and that loan is not 
due. So how then can there be a foreclosure on an obligation that is not yet due? Okay? There is talk about Zesco, our electricity utility company. Zesco has two projects. One is the Kariba North, and the other one is the Kafua Lower. These are sub-projects of Zesco, which is um, undertaking in partnership with Chinese companies. Again, these loans are not due yet. The third one is um, the one concerning the Zambia National Broadcasting Corporation, our national broadcaster. China came in because the government wanted to accelerate the digital migration process. So what ZNBC did was to go into partnership with uh, Star Times, a Chinese company, to create a special purpose vehicle in a company called Top Star, which has been given the rights to roll out and implement digital migration in the country. And again, these loans have just been dispersed. Way, 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 maturity is not now. So when people say these assets have been seized, these assets have been taken over, it's absolutely ludicrous. All of you are reasonable people, you know how financing works. These loans are not due. Including the euro bond which we got from the West, its maturity is in 2021. So how come people are not talking about the, you know, the euro bond, but they choose to talk about um, our other data obligations? So as regard to the current status quo and where we are in terms of our debt um, indebtedness and whether we've defaulted or not, the loans are not due. But having said that, as people, as a citizen, our question is, what is the level of appetite for our government in terms of getting more Chinese loans? And will we have the ability in future to repay these loans looking at our weakening quacha. That is the question. That is our worry. That's what keeps us up at night. Because, yes, the Chinese have put 60 billion on the table. Personally, I said, wow. I wanted 4 billion of that, six, of that 60 billion so we can develop, but talk a lower, which we share with Zimbabwe, so that we can deal with our energy inefficiencies once and for all. And my friends came to me to say, hey, Chalimba, so you are now encouraging government to get um, 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 more loans from China, digging us um, deeper into our grave. I said, let me tell you one thing. These load sheddings we are having are not taking us anywhere. They're retarding our development. They're retarding our progress. I would rather we go out and get the four billion, sort out Batoka, so we have secure power, which we can export to the DRC, Mozambique, South Africa, Namibia. We can get back that money. I've always said it's what we're doing with the money that we're getting more than what the, uh, what the amount of that money is. And this is where I concur with my brother from Kenya when he talks about the deal. Because in Zambia, there's two deals. There's the deal deal and there's the deal. So which deal are we going for? If we're going for the deal that is in the country's interest, that is good for development, I can sleep with that. And I'll gladly pass on the liability of my great-grandchildren to pay the deal because it would have paved um, um, a good way for their future. But if we're going for the deal deals, then we have a problem. Then yes. Come the future, we might start defaulting on some of these um, loan obligations that we have, then God knows what will happen then. I asked the Minister of Finance to say, what security did you pledge when you were getting these loans? Her honest answer was, there's a Chinese company called, insurance company called Sinosure. All these loans are secured through an insurance taken out through Sinoshore. Did you attach any of these national assets to these loans? She said no. Well, we'll have to see what happens 10, 15 years from now when we start defaulting whether she was telling the truth or not. But I have no reason not to trust her or believe what she said. This is what 
I'm sharing here with you. Currently, we have a huge Chinese presence in Zambia and their investments are massive. They have taken over our third, fourth, and fifth biggest mines on the Copper Belt. So we have Chambeshi, and they have even created an economic zone called the Amphes, which they run. And they run um, a mine that employs people in the range of about 23,000 people, miners um, on, on that site. In Lusaka, next to the international airport, there is also another special zone called the Lusaka East Multifacility Economic Zone, which has been given to the Chinese to operate and have their companies um, um, run and do business there. These special multifacility economic zones are not exclusive to the Chinese. Anybody can come to Zambia and go to the Zambia Development Agency through the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry and apply for such special dispensation. It is open. Why certain people are not keen to take up these, I do not know. But those opportunities are there and the Chinese have uh, taken advantage of um, that opportunity and they have invested massively on, on, on the Copper Belt. Now talking about Chinese investment, and one of the previous speaker touched on this a little bit, the challenge that we see is that with a massive infrastructure development taking place in Zambia, it be road, it be buildings, it be mining, is that we now see a huge influx of Chinese labor coming to do the work. I was just telling you that we have two fantastic stadiums, one in Dole and one in Osaka. We had a lot of Chinese workers working on there as well as the Zambians. I've always asked the questions, can we build a stadium on our own since one was built right here in our country? The answer is probably no, because there was no skills transfer. So they came in with their um, drawings, with their labor, with their technology, and it was like a 10 cube project, boom, you have a stadium. We were additional labor, additional help there. We can't probably even put up a 5,000-seater stadium. For me, these are the challenges that I see with um, some of these Chinese investments coming into the country. The same is said about the mines. There are certain mundane, routine type of work which you would expect a Zambian to execute. But we see a lot of um, Chinese nationals actually doing um, that type of a work. Who do you blame? Those people are not in the country legally, no. They're there legally. So they came in through uh, passport control, they went through immigration, permits were given, meaning they are kosher with the law. Maybe the issue is our law. Maybe. Should we tighten it? Should we restrictive? Should we have quota systems where we say only a certain number of Zambians can do this. Currently, Zambian laws do not prohibit a foreigner to trade, do business in whatever you wish. You can open a spaza, you can sell talk time, you can sell chickens, you can vend donuts, you can own land as a company. Nobody stops you. So these are the uh, discussions I think as a people, as Zambians, we need to be talking about as opposed to quickly um, crying wolf and saying, hey, we have a big elephant in the room. Maybe we need to tighten the laws and maybe we need to have restrictions or maybe we need to have a quota system. Then we can be able to say, we did this, but these guys are still coming in and overrunning us and taking every opportunity that is us. But currently, the law does not prohibit any foreigner who wants to come into the country to run a business, as long as you comply with the necessary statutory bodies and the statutory, statutory laws. Um, currently, our government is sort of in discussions with the IMF for a bailout because we are financially challenged. 
These talks have been going on for the past three years, and they don't seem to go anywhere. And I keep saying, maybe we don't need the IMF, because we have an history, a history with the IMF. In the mid-80s, when Dr. Kaunda was president, we actually broke off relationships with the IMF. And in 1986, thereabouts, Dr. Kaunda came up with a program that says we have to grow from our own resources. We completely got cut off from IMF. Subsequent to that, we went back to the IMF, went through all the structure adjustment programs, and under Levi Manawatha, we even achieved HIPIC. And we had most of our debt written out. If we are smart, again, going by what my friend from Kenya was saying, nothing stops us in engaging the Chinese and saying, we are in a debt stress, let's, rene let's renegotiate. China just said they're going to write off um, debt for landlocked countries. They've done it with Botswana. We are landlocked. Maybe we need to engage them and try and get debt relief from them and get additional funding from them. And seeing we seem to be a preferred destination for them, it's in their best interest that we do not default on these loans. They need to come to our aid. If you ask me, that would be the counsel that I would give to our government to say, get back to these guys and make sure we don't fail. Because if you fail, then they have nothing. People have, again, accused our relationship with China, saying, oh, China is only interested in one thing, your resources. I ask a question, what about Ethiopia? Ethiopia does not have the natural resources that we have, but they seem to have an even bigger presence there than they do in Zambia. So this isolation and targeting of Zambia is really, really very, very curious to us as Zambians because now we're beginning to think maybe we are, because we are small boys, it's easy for us to, it's easy for everybody to pick on us and set an example to the big boys like um, Ethiopia, Nigeria to say, if you also close up to uh, China the way Zambia is, we'll, we'll, we'll really come after you. But I don't see our relationship with China as problematic. What I'm interested in is what are the rules of this relationship? What are the terms of our engagement? It's very rare, like what Dr. David said, that you'll ever get to get to see the details of the loan agreements that government go in, whether it's the Chinese, whether it's um, the Europeans, whether it's the IMF. Most of the things we do speculate. But at the end of the day, a loan is a loan, and it has to be um, honored, and it has to be serviced, regardless of where it's coming from. It would be nice now, like I said, if we could have a leadership, if we could have politicians that really go for the deal, because that's what our countries need. Zambia belongs to SADC, COMESA, the AU, and is non-aligned. So to us, we don't look west, we don't look east. We do what we think is prudent for our people and our country. And we honestly do, that's why we've had so many, we, I mean, we now average two and a half years before we change presidents. That's why we continuously change our leaders because we are hopeful that we are electing the right people and those people would do, would do the, right, the right thing. Um, the other interesting thing, you know, for 10 years, from 2006 to 2016, I was chairman for Comesa's Regional Investment Agency. Now, Comesa's Regional Investment Agency is a collection of the 19 Comesa countries, which all have an IPA, an Investment Promotion Agency, and they've come together to say, Let's create this big market of about 350 million people and with a single voice attract investment into, into the region. The interesting thing is, in Comesa, you have an Egypt, a Libya, you also have a Malawi and a Swaziland. So you can see how 
diverse the economic grouping is. Now, if you apply one rule like free movement of people, goods, and services, Egypt has 120 million people, Ethiopia has 90 to 100 million people, Zambia has 15, Malawi has 20, we don't produce much, they can overrun us. We won't even be talking about China, but we'll be talking about our own members now taking full advantage of this economic grouping. Something trivial, we see it these days because you wake up in the morning, you hear your gate bell being rang, and you get, to, you get to see who's at the gate. It's an Egyptian selling you carpets. It's allowed. Those are the rules of being members of Comesa, and there's absolutely nothing wrong. It's what we signed up for. So those are some of the things that we talk about. We just had the FOCAC meeting in China. People sometimes tend to forget that that's not the only fora where countries get to meet and seek for financial help. The Europeans have EDF. The Japanese have TICAD. The Americans used to run AGOA. The interesting thing about the last FOCAC meeting was almost every African president, uh, head of state was there with an exception of Swaziland. They had a sellout event, better than the attendance that just happened at the UNGA. That should tell you something of what's happening in Africa and of what Africa wants and who probably is offering the terms and conditions that are favorable for the African countries. Brilliant. Um, just to wind up, um, when we talk about China and Africa relations, I think, uh, Dr. Uh, David, in future, we need to unbundle Africa, because Africa is not a country. And we need to start saying China, Zambia, China, Ethiopia, China, Kenya, China, Zambia. Listening to what our Ethiopian colleagues said and listening to what our Kenyan colleagues said, totally different story. Also totally different from the Zambian story. But when we continuously start saying uh, China, Africa, China, South Africa, maybe others have good stories to share and others have bad stories to share, but let's not water it down and have this cocktail called Africa, which paints all of us the same because we're not. I think it's very important if we are seen uh, within our sovereignty and within our own identity where it is, if we're here, we'll be able to say, oh, now it's China, Zambia discussion that we're having, as opposed to a blanket um, headline that says, um, um, China, Africa. Thank you very much. Thanks for Mr. Pierre's presentation. The second speaker is Bongai Gasseler. He is a researcher at the University of Johannesburg Confucius Institute. His research interests include African-China relations, having done his thesis on the relationship between Zambia and the People's Republic of China after the imposition of sanctions by the US and the European. Additional topics of interest include the evolution of India foreign policy since independent and India-Africa relations as well as BRICS. Let's welcome Dr. Bungai Gassner. Thank you, Prof. I'm Mr. Nuts Doctor. <laughs> Mine is very simple. I'm just going to talk you through the pledges that were made by China at the 2018 FOCAC Summit and give the way forward by first looking at the missed opportunities. But first of all, I'd like to take you through the Johannesburg Plan of Action, which took place in 2015. The 2018 FOCAC Summit was preceded by the China Africa Think Tank, which, which sought to recall the achievement made from the 60 billion US dollars that China pledged towards Africa's development at the 2015 Johannesburg Summit. 
This forum was held in the backdrop of the 40th anniversary of China's reform and opening up under the theme China-Africa relations over the course of reform and opening up. This forum was attended by more than 380 representatives and diplomats from 44 African countries. Found out at the forum was that in 2017, the export and import volume between China and Africa reached 170 billion US dollars, and China's direct investment in Africa is beyond 40 billion US dollars, with over 10,000 Chinese companies operating in Africa. Some of the notable achievements have been alluded to by Dr. Western Shilao are the infrastructure projects, such as the installation of a 480 kilometers long Mombasa to Nairobi railway line, which is the largest infrastructure project in Kenya since its independence. This project was worth 3.8 billion US dollars, and it helped Kenya record a 1.5% growth in GDP and the creation of 38,000 jobs in the construction sector. The other one is the creation of the, the installation of the Addis Ababa Djibouti railway line that Dr. Tefera, Prof. Tefera alluded to. This railway was funded by the Chinese Exim Bank, and the total cost of the project was in the region of 4.5 billion which is half a billion more than it was initially planned. The railway is financed, was financed by the Ethiopian government and the loans from China. But due to the Ethiopian government's inability to finish the project on time, as the Ethiopian Railway Corporation was faced with 3.8, 3.7 billion debt and had started repaying the loans without completing the project. So now the railway system is managed by China, by China Railway Group and the China Civil Engineering Construction Corporation. These two companies will be managing and maintaining the railway line and training of the employees until 2023. The 2018 FOCAC Summit marked 18 years of an enhanced effort on the part of China for friendly social economic and developmental partnership between China and all African United Nations member states, with the exception of Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland, which still maintains ties with Taiwan. And also the summit also saw the growing footprint of China and Africa with new entrants into the FOCAC, which are Burkina Faso, Sao Tome and Principe, and the Gambia. The summit also took place in the backdrop of the unfolding trade war between China and, uh, and the US. This war began when the US imposed tariff on Chinese products worth 34 billion US dollars, and China retaliated with a similar tariff on US products destined to China, which are mainly agricultural products. The trade war was later escalated when Donald Trump again imposed an additional tariff of 25% on Chinese products worth 16 billion US dollars. If we look at this trade war, it has far reaching implications, especially to Africa, given that the continent is of strategic importance to both China and America, but particularly China because China is Africa's number one trade partner. There are growing concerns that the Chinese products that were destined to the US could be diverted to Africa and resulting in flooding American markets. However, Africa could take advantage of the trade war and replace America as China's supplier of agricultural products. China could invest in Africa's agricultural sector where unemployment could be created and food scarcity be alleviated. For example, if you look at Burundi, this is a country where agriculture contributes over 50% of the gross domestic product and also employs 90% of the population. China could also look to such countries as Burundi for trade in agricultural products, which mainly comprise of tea and coffee, 
and these two commodities account for 90% of the country's foreign exchange. Despite the unfolding trade war, African expectations were very high regarding the forum as they sought to find ways of further deepening and consolidating their relations with China after 18 years of developmental partnership that has seen various Chinese sponsored infrastructural projects being implemented in Africa. Notwithstanding these contributions in Africa, Africa is facing economic and social problems such as corruption, poverty. And in the midst of this, there are fears that African countries are at the risk of being trapped in debt because of borrowing far beyond their capacity to repay the loans. Since the inception of FOCAC in, 20, in year 2000, China has borrowed Africa over 130 billion, mainly for infrastructure development. At this year's Beijing summit, China pledged a China pledged 60 billion, which matched the pledge it made at the Johannesburg summit in 2015. The only difference is that the Chinese government will only contribute 50 billion, and the difference of 10 billion is to come from Chinese private companies operating in Africa. For the three-year period from 2019 to 2021, President Xi announced eight major areas of cooperation that will be financed using the 60 billion US dollars. And these are number one, peace and security initiative. Through this, there could be an establishment of a China-Africa peace and security fund through which China will provide funds for the AU for peacekeeping missions and combating terrorism. He also opened a trade facilitation initiative which seeks to increase China's import of non-resource products from Africa. The third one was the healthcare initiative, which seeks to boost Africa's 50 medical and health programs, which include the training of medical personnel. Infrastructure connectivity initiative, which supports Chinese firms operating in African infrastructure development. This will also work closely with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the development, a new development bank with the aim of promoting the Belt and Road Initiative. Then there was the people-to-people -people exchange through which China seeks to promote the establishment of Confucius Institute in Africa. It also financed the establishment of African Studies Institutes in China. This initiative will also be used to promote tourism between China and Africa. There is the Industrial Promotion Initiative, which will support trade and investments through the establishment and improvement of economic zones in Africa. It, it will also be used to develop Africa's agricultural sector. Then we have the Green Development Initiative, through this, there will be 50 exchange and cooperation projects in relation to climate change, wildlife protection, desertification prevention and control. These pledges for the next three years have diversified from the pledges that were made by China in, during, at the summit held in Johannesburg in 2015. One of the notable improvements is the establishment of the Trade Facilitation Initiative. African countries could sh should utilize this initiative so as to promote the export of African manufactured products. This would promote employment in Africa's manufacturing sectors and mitigate the allegations that China is colonizing Africa in the sense that they only import African minerals and export them back to Africa as finished products. As I told you, mine was going to be very simple. Now I'm going to the conclusions. I'm going to touch on the missed opportunities and offer the way forward where possible. The delegates at the Beijing summit discussed cooperation in areas that Africa and China needs to put focus on, but were not discussed enough so as, as it is to discussing all areas of cooperation between Africa and China. is next to impossible when the time comes 
to talk about other areas of cooperation, which will be like three years in the next three years. So I would propose changing the summit from an every three years event to an annual event, just like the AU United Nations, could help identify and address areas that need to be looked at timelessly. Some of the missed opportunities at the summit was, the, was addressing the issues, which is number one in Africa, the issue of corruption. According to international media, Chinese projects in Africa are said to be fueling corruption in African governments because of China's non-interference policy in the domestic affairs of African countries, as well as its no strings attached loans. The AU has declared 2018 as the year of winning the fight against corruption. And it is committed to fighting this problem and it signed several treaties aimed at ensuring democracy, rule of law, and good governance. But much needs to be done here. Corruption continues to harm Africa, hampering democracy, development, and the ability to bring people out of poverty. Africa ranks as the lowest, as the lowest amongst global regions in the Corruption Perception Index. Countries in Africa average 32 out of 100 in their CPI scores, and six out of the bottom 10, African, 10 countries are African. China pledged to support African governments in the fight against corruption at the FOCAC summit by setting a law enforcement and security forum that will facilitate police, police exchange and we also provide police equipment to African countries and offer Chinese language courses for law enforcement officers. This, I view, will be a good initiative, but the issue of combating corruption is the prerogative of African governments and the AU. Then another issue which was not discussed extensively is the issue of the debt trap. This narrative is circulating in the media and it says that China, Africa is at the risk of being trapped in debt because of borrowing funds that exceed their capacity to repay, even before the previous debts have been repaid. The issue of loan repayments and, action, and actions that may take place should any country detract in repaying should have been addressed at this FOCAC summit. Perhaps the cause of concerns in terms of borrowing beyond the capacity to repay has been the leasing of the Hambatota port in Sri Lanka for 99 years to China due to the Sri Lankan government's failure to repay the Chinese loans that were borrowed to fund the airport. But this does not mean that it could happen to Africa as China is already the continent's number one trade partner. In the case of Sri Lanka, the country is, is of strategic importance both to China and India so taking over the port gives China leverage over India, which it already, which it already because China has 77% of Sri Lanka's national debt. This case is seen by the international media as setting precedence to the seizure of foreign assets by China due to defaulting in repayments of loans. Another case coming closer to home is the Zambian case, which Mr. Piri alluded to of the unfounded allegations that China is taking over the Kenneth Kaunda airport, which in actual fact is still under construction. Then we have the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the Chinese government's flagship. With regards to Africa, the Belt and Road Initiative could be used for the benefit of Africa, as Dr. Monyai alluded earlier, not only as a conduit for transporting African minerals to China and import, importing them as finished products. It could also be used to transport goods manufactured in Africa, and this would ensure that the partnership between China and its African allies is symmetrical. The Belt and Road Initiative could also be used to promote people-to-people -people exchange between Africa and China through education, which is demonstrated by the growing number of Confucius Institute in Africa. And also, the BRI could also be used to promote African cultures and languages in China, in the same way Chinese culture is making great inroads in African countries through these institutes of learning. 
To obtain optimum results from the BRI, African governments should come with their own policies regarding the BRI because the BRI is a Chinese project which was made known in 2013 and introduced to a large number of African countries in 2015, two years after, under the document titled African Vision and Actions on Jointly Building Silk Road, Economic Belt in the 21st Century Maritime Silk Road. This document emphasized that the BRI was economic oriented. Contrary to the claims in inter international media that the initiative was geostrategic. While this may be true, the BRI does not exclude geostrategic matters, but on the grand theme of things, the focus is on economic relations and to grant China access to overseas markets. The marginalization of Africa in the initial announcements of the BRI in 2013 should be a cause for concern for African leaders as this initiative came in the form of a top bottom approach which Africa was on the receiving bottom end. The BRI could also be used as a grand strategy and Africa is a continent of diverse economies and as such the African leaders should implement country specific policies with regards to the BRI instead of taking it as a one size fits all policy. Then there was the issue of research and innovation, which is a very serious issue when it comes to Africa. The African leaders should start prioritizing in more or less the way they regard economic cooperation with China for the exchange of technological know-how. Even that we are entering in the era of the fourth industrial re revolution and China is the best country to learn from since it is at a stage where machine learning tools are finding their ways into the economy. There is a shortage of technological know-how in some parts of Africa. For example, in Madagascar. Madagascar is an attractive destination for foreign investments and China has made great inroads into the island, but its investments have been concentrated on China's strategic areas, such as the agricultural sector, with particular interest on the production of rice as Madagascar is the largest per capita consumer and importer of rice. In the same country, the extraction sector is dominated by Chinese firms. In 2009, China invested over 60.6 .6 billion and, and 10,000 of that amount went to other sectors besides mining. On the manufacturing side, the sector is primarily composed of joint ventures between Chinese firms and the local firms with little technological transfer. Despite the growing number of Chinese firms operating in Madagascar, there is little investments being carried out by the Chinese firms within the boundaries of Madagascar. Then we come to the issue that has been making international headlines, which is the militarization of Africa. This is another topic that needed extensive discussion. Although China made an initiative for peace and security in Africa by assisting in combating piracy and promoting peace and security, the discussions should have touched on the militarization of Djibouti, which is a topic that attracted widespread attention when China established a military base alongside the French, the Japanese, and the US. Militarization of African territories whether for peacekeeping efforts or fighting terrorism in the continent are issues that fall under the jurisdiction of the AU. However, the AU does not have total control because the military presence of foreign troops in Djibouti is based on bilateral agreements between Djibouti and the present military forces. I thank you. Thanks for Mr. Bengani's presentation. Now we are again turn to the question and answer session. Good afternoon. My name is Dumi Kabela. My company is called Vital Enterprises Investment Corporations, investment holdings rather. I'm also a part-time student here at UJ, 
doing a course on social innovation and social, social enterprises and social innovation. I have a question on the Zambian presentation. Uh, it was quite intriguing and impressive for me to hear that 53% of your date is actually for commercial purposes. However, what I have an interest in is how much is it to your GDP, your whole debt? And um, <clears throat> another question I have is the writing off of debt by the Chinese. They seem to have a particular interest on the landlocked countries. The question is why? Why are they picking them? And then the last speaker, I just have a question on how much of this relationship on FOCAC benefits small businesses in South Africa and everywhere else? How much of these investments that we're getting from China actually have a direct bearing on small businesses in the countries that they invest in? Because up to this end, I'm hearing a lot of investments which seem to have impression of it's on about big businesses and national businesses. But the question is, how much of that gets to small business generation and motivation? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Itu Maleng, and I'm with uh, Political Analysis South Africa. My question is, with, uh, is actually directed to Mr. Piri regarding the Zambian uh, uh, situation where China is quite present. I mean, the whole course of China-Africa discourse, you know, when you talk about it or when you hear about it, you will swear that there is an oncoming plague of frogs and the death of the firstborn, so to speak. You know, it's quite a controversial uh, space. But a, a couple of years ago when Michael, the late uh, former president Michael Sata was running for presidency of Zambia, he was running on the ticket of uh, getting away from China, breaking away the ties with China and literally painting China as this ogre of a, of a, of a dragon that is just about to devour everyone. But then when he got uh, uh, elected, his tune completely changed. And in fact, the first uh, uh, outside visit for him was to Beijing. And <laughs> the policy literally didn't come through because of the strength of, of China. What actually uh, what what changed his position from the zero to the 180 uh, completely? Thank you. Great things. My name is Tati, a student at the University of Johannesburg. Um, when you were speaking about the uh, developing policies that uh, favor us in terms of ownership, I totally agree with you because of uh, we need to protect ourselves because protection is mostly what we need from commercializations and also uh, on economies of scale. We look at uh, when we go into global economies, uh, our Japanese have uh, protected their commercial space in, in automotive industry. We look at uh, India, they have protection in the agricultural sector. Or for example, also Canada, they have a protection in the film industry. But you look at on Africa, those uh, bilateral and multilateral agreements uh, are somehow bipolarized because of they end up being a unilateral agreement where the majority benefactor is either not us, but uh, the one who came in the form of uh, aiding and assistance. But at the end, we get to see that everything that is uh, commercialized here, it is not owned by Africans for Africans by Africa, particularly in Africa. We don't have any sort of protection in any industry whatsoever. So what we need to uh, write down or come up with the policies as policies that protect our unique commodities in terms of no one or any country can come and have total ownership in that commercial space where it should be sufficiently benefiting the South Africans in whatever way possible in development, in infrastructure and socio-economic of scale. So on those uh, multilateral agreements, we need to devise a system or a hybrid model in terms of we look at the feasibility and the viability of trade, of import and export in which is benefiting the, the majority or the host country in where the resources are being mined and when they are uh, imported or exported, they come as a final product or we're sending them as a raw product. Which policy is favoring which and then 
as, as they come to the country of the host? How come that the protection that the policies are made by countries that are coming to invade us? So the whole thing, it looks to me like it's a form of recolonization. It's no longer republic democracy. It's a form of recolonization where all the wealth creation is re directed to the Eastern or Western hegemony. So for me, those kind of policies, they need to be revisited and they need to be revitalized Thank you, for, for a 50-50 beneficial relationship. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Tommy, your question on what percentage of debt uh, it is to GDP, it's 22%. That's why I told you it makes me feel better because the Kenyans say they were above 50 so we still have breathing space to take it to even 40, if only we are borrowing for the right reasons. And what we are borrowing will benefit the country. Um, the other question was about why landlocked um, countries are being favored in terms of um, the debt write-off. I really don't know. But maybe it's because we don't have um, the certain advantages that um, the other countries that have uh, ports and access to the seas do have. We were having a conversation earlier on with my colleague from Ethiopia, and I was commending uh, his prime minister to say, in under 100 days, he was able to resolve the Eritrean challenge. And one of the benefits is their access to port through Eritrea. Uh, Eritrea is shorter and cheaper. They benefit massively. If you think about it, not so long ago, there used to be one country. So they were not landlocked. They actually had a port. We don't have that. We have eight countries uh, surrounding Zambia, you know, DRC, Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, Angola, our access to the ports, very far, very expensive. Maybe it's what China is looking at as a way of trying to ease our burden, but I don't know. They'll be able to answer that. Um, Itumileng, you ask questions about Michael Sata. You are actually spot on. I do know you follow Zambian politics are close. Uh, Mr. Sata first attempted um, to be president in 2001. And he came third um, when Awasa won the election. Uh, the late Anderson Mazoka came third. He came third, he came third with about 2% of the vote. In 2006, he increased his popularity substantially. Mr. Sata is your, was a streetwise politician who really played to the court of public opinion and to the masses. His message was very simple. More money in your pockets, lower taxes. How, he didn't explain. People bought it. Yes, he had a very strong anti-Chinese message, which people bought into. As you've rightly put it, when he became elected in 2011, China was still what it had been with Zambia. Nothing changed. He did visit China. He even started implementing what we now see, uh, a road infrastructure program called Link Zambia 8000. So he built 8000 of tarred road across the country, across the country with Chinese assistance. The same person who was doing the campaigns saying anti-Chinese things, but I guess that's politics. You gotta do what you need to do to win. Then once you're there, then you say, I'll do the right thing, or I will do what seems to be popular, or what the norm is. So that's what happened with um, um, our late president. His infrastructure um, agenda has still been carried on. Now we have the L200 and the L400 being rolled out on the copper belt. For those 
that have probably visited Zambia over a period of four years, you can see the transformation in terms of how networked the roads are. And every time you see, I mean, we're a construction site, you know, there's roads being built on a daily basis. Now this, I suppose, from a visual standpoint, is what gets people thinking to say, this, at what cost are we able to? Because we haven't seen anything like it. Um, Tato, you're talking about protectionism against foreigners so that um, we protect um, locals. I have a problem with that, and I'll tell you why. That's the beginning of xenophobic tendencies. I think competition is good. I think we should all be Latin, uh, even playing fields, and then we get a go at it. If we're not careful with laws that exclude and discriminate, the lazy tend to find the easy way out. You know? I look at the USA, the America. You can go there as a student, you can get a job. You can graduate, you apply for a work permit, you get a job. Very rarely will people saying, you so and so are taking our jobs. But of course, in the recent months, we're seeing that. So, in this part of the world, now speak for Zambia, I think, ish, it's a bit tricky, but has to be navigated carefully. Otherwise, we might just be inciting our people to turn against foreigners. Yeah? But I do agree with you when it comes to you can't open yourself up 100%. You just can't. There are certain things really where domestic workers, I think we have enough Zambians who can do that. We don't have to import domestic workers from uh, Southeast Asia. I, I don't think we need to do that. Um, people working on road construction who are just pushing wheelbarrows, you know, or flagging cars to tell them when to go and when to go. I think we have enough Zambians who can do that. We don't need um, experts to come and uh, occupy that space. Unless it's for skills that are not readily available, which we do not have, maybe we need to put uh, in place um, laws that will protect and ring fence that to the locals. Um, you also talked about the issue on value addition, why we export raw materials. Um, in our 2019 budget, which was given um, three weeks ago, one of the measures that the finance minister has put in place is we are copper producing, and most of our copper goes out of the country raw and then comes back as a finished product. So what she's done is to say, for any company that adds value to the copper before it's exported, the corporate tax will be reduced from 35% to 15. If you're in business, that is massive. So people hopefully will be encouraged to um, open up refineries and then start processing the copper before it goes out. The challenge with that is, do we have capacity in terms of uh, volumes of copper to warrant somebody setting up a refinery so that uh, it's that before it goes out? Otherwise, they might as well say, I'm happy to pay 35% of the corporate tax because my investment in a refinery here will not be justified by the amount of volumes and quantities that the copper is being produced in the country. Thank you. Question directed to Mrs. Dumire. Uh, I wish I could answer that, but uh, my focus has been on China's Zim relations, but you've given me a challenge. Or oh, Dr. David Munya could help me in that regard to answer it of the impact the Chinese investments had made to private companies in South Africa. We'd call, we could also incorporate it into our forthcoming policy brief. Thank you. Okay, it's time for a conclusion. 
Okay, I let's invite my partner, Dr. David Moyayi, to some conclusion and uh, thanks uh, for all the guests. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, conclude, just give uh, firstly to thank the University of Johannesburg Library, our partner uh, in this um, work, uh, the IT here that has been so helpful. I um, would like to thank the Oxfam, uh, the Pan-African um, branch of Oxfam that we're working with. We are editing a book as we speak uh, on um, China, Africa, that uh, our institute is editing. Um, the book should be, I can see Basso is looking at me. I, <laughs> we are busy with that, uh, uh, preoccupying our, um, um, our time. And would like to also um, thank our special guest, um, uh, brothers from uh, Ethiopia, Zambia, uh, Kenya is no longer a Kenyan, he's more of South African. Um, as well as uh, uh, all of you who are here, who have attended. Um, and I will make a huge mistake if I don't mention um, uh, our staff. Uh, behind the scene, you see us standing here. There is a, a huge team of people uh, who run around uh, to put together uh, this event. We um, have a wonderful team um, and staff, our colleagues who are here. Um, I would like to thank them. I would like to thank Basso. Uh, he, um, he's been also running around. Uh, he has been there from day one uh, in terms of um, the concept note, uh, the preparation, the invitations, uh, all the good things goes to Basso. Um, and uh, I would like to thank all of you. We are going to have a video that will be available um, on our webpage so you can access uh, all the proceedings from this uh, session, two sessions uh, will be available. We have produced two uh, policy briefs and we're expecting one on Zambia uh, without putting pressure on my brother, um, Piri. <laughs> We want uh, uh, a, a thorough analysis of Zambia that you have provided. Um, um, one of the major issues and concerns that we have on the African continent, it's our failure to archive our own material. It is important for us to, uh, 10, 20, 50 years from now, uh, the future generation will have to look back and, and, and want to know exactly what kind of debates were happening in this year. And therefore, I think University of Johannesburg is doing quite well in that regard. Um, archiving uh, African stories uh, academically, Riga, uh, evidence-based. As the China-Africa debate is growing, we cannot avoid it. Um, uh, there's no easy answer, but there's only one thing we can say. The relationship is growing faster than we uh, are debating it. Uh, the volumes alone are speaking uh, people to people, cultural exchange both in China and in, 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 in Africa. Uh, we're seeing quite a number of positive uh, good stories. Um, the benefits of our, when my apology, I was outside for an interview. Uh, the benefits for South African um, private companies are uh, question. Um, I don't know the full um, question. W w what was, who asked the question? Oh, good, good. Very good question. Um, there are big companies which have an ad advantage. I think these big companies, mega companies, banks such as Standard Bank, SAPI, I mean, as you know, uh, SAPI is doing extremely well it's because of Tencent, I think, for those who are following the markets. Um, and it was a wise move for SAPI to invest in Tencent. 
uh, when it was small. And now Tencent is huge. It's a gigantic company. Um, I think you're seeing more of that, that a number of South African companies are going to China. But we want to see more of that. Because as it stands, there are more of Chinese companies coming here. I think that is to do with our lack uh, of those companies. Um, we, we have to improve on our raw materials. We cannot rely on selling raw materials. China's economy uh, has reached a point where it has um, reached oversupply. It, it, it has is developed to a level that it wants to invest in other areas. Um, it's no longer the leading when it comes to manufacturing. Um, it's reached a point where it is investing outside China. Uh, labor cost in China is going higher. So China is no longer that China that used to have cheap labor. Um, the labor in China is growing much faster. I think uh, these Chinese companies, they are coming. Ethiopia has benefited quite a lot. Uh, but the bigger question is that we as Africans have to ensure that we put our regulatory framework in place and ensure that we can attract this company, employ more people, and the your question falls within that uh, context. We need African smaller business uh, to find a niche within this growing. Uh, uh, and, 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 however, the question needs to be directed to South African government in terms of what is it that it is doing to ensure that South African small business have opportunity to export to China. But the bigger question, as we said, what kind of exports? Are we raw material or finished goods? We have to work with Chinese in partnership to ensure that uh, we beneficiate whatever we, we add value to what we are selling outside. Um, we talk about selling bananas. I think uh, if you go to Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka produces bananas. We can't all of us, 55 countries, go shipping bananas to China. Um, Asian countries are shipping bananas there. And you might find by the time our bananas get in China, they are bad because of distance and, and time. And while those from Sri Lanka, they are much looking better. And Chinese might prefer Sri Lankan bananas than Africans. So we, we, we have to think outside the box. I think that's the point that I'm trying to make, that we are competing for China and Chinese investment. We are not only competing among ourselves as Africans, we are also are competing with China's immediate neighbors um, within Asia uh, in Latin America. So we have to up our game in terms of in what areas do we interact with China for the benefit of Africans. So I think on that uh, uh, topic, I would like to bring this meeting to an end and thank you all once again for being here for such a long time. And we look forward next year um, to have some of these public dialogues and conversation going forward. I thank you.